Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed my last video about the new iPad app for Luminar. Luminar for iPad, it's fun. I'm having a great time with it. And I was editing a photo and I thought, you know what might be useful is for me to walk through a full editing workflow demonstrating how the different tools work because it's new, it's different, and figuring it out can be a little fun. Uh, fun. And by the way, uh, Apple Pencil works incredibly, incredibly well. I've been asked if I'm using a mouse uh, or an Apple Pencil. When I'm editing, I'm using both, although I prefer the pencil. When I make these videos, I'm using the mouse a lot because you can see the red little dot that I put around the mouse. Uh, so just FYI on that. And what I'm going to do is do a little screen mirroring. And there you go. You can now see uh, I'm in my raw file section of the photos that I've added to Luminar for iPad. And I'm going to grab this photo here. And in fact, let me set the pencil down. Um, and what I'm going to do is walk through and edit. And so uh, I'm not going to do sky replacement in this video. And I'm probably not going to use any of the presets either, which um, all of which are handy. Uh, and, you know, again, I recommend if you haven't seen my first video to check it out. But this app is so much fun and it's really easy to use. And you can just make a lot of powerful adjustments to a photo without really spending a lot of time on it. So it's great for on the go kind of quick edits, as I said in that previous video. This is a prime example of how I would use it. This is a raw file that I shot with my iPhone in Iceland on one of the Luminar trips. And I love this photo. And I just want to come in and enhance certain aspects of that photo. And that's what's so good about this app. So I'm going to start by dragging the temperature slider slightly left. And tint, I think, is fine. I think highlights. I'm going to bring those down a little bit. So I just grab about where the H is and I kind of twist it to where that um, let me show you. I twist it, let's see, to the right so that this uh, little orange kind of uh, line that's above the H kind of tilts to the left. I hope that makes sense. Uh, shadows, I'm actually going to make those a little bit darker as well because I want to bring up the contrast in this photo. I'm going to do a slight increase in exposure, a slight bump in whites, and these just go up and down, so that's pretty easy a slight drop in the blacks, because you can see I'm kind of creating that contrast. And this squiggly line that I, I just love is the contrast slider. And so I'm going to come down here and grab that and just drag that contrast. And you can kind of see what's happening to the photo. It's getting more contrasty. Now remember, you've got this kind of on-off switch here for each of the different uh, filter or tool sections. So I can just click that to turn off. And you can already see I've made a massive, massive difference in my photo just in develop and I'm not even done in fact I'm going to do a little bit with vignette so you just drag that one to the left and this this is basically a walkthrough of the different tools uh, drag that to the left and this one down here is both saturation and vibrance um, saturation increases when you drag it to the right you will see the text and the saturation number going up as I do it vibrance increases as I drag it up uh, and so if I go kind of north, if you will, it's getting more vibrant. Now, that's way too much, so I just recommend being a little bit careful. And I'm going to pull both of these back a little bit, but I wanted a little bit of kick in saturation of vibrance. There really is a lot of blue here, and this is called a Yakul Salon, if I said that properly, which I doubt that I did. It's a famous glacial lagoon in Iceland. But you can already see, just using those tools, massive, massive difference, and I'm loving that. Accent AI, well, it's Enhance AI, but it's effectively what I call Accent AI, uh, which is one of a couple of tools that's in the Enhance AI category in Luminar Neo. But this is a typical radio dial, so you literally just turn the dial just like you would on the radio, and uh, that's going to increase the, the use of this uh, filter here. Uh, I don't want to go that high. I tend to go kind of like a quarter of the way. It depends. Uh, each image is different, and I find myself... It could be shiny object syndrome, but I find myself with the iPad app pushing things a little further, going a little more saturated, a little more oomph, uh, but it's probably just because it's shiny object, right? New fun thing, and I would just want to push the sliders around and kind of boss them around. Uh, but that's how that one works. So very simple and straightforward. Structure AI, of course, you can just grab that and drag it to the right, and that will increase the structure. Uh, and that's across the entire photo. And of course, and I showed this in the last video, if you go left, it will decrease structure, which smooths it out. But for me, I want to bring the structure up because all these uh, bits of frost here and these chunks of ice and all this stuff, it's just super, super cool. 
This is one of my probably one of my favorite iPhone photos. Uh, and doing a quick edit here in Luminar for iPad is a lot of fun. Now, a Relight AI is great for foreground and background lighting. And the background, which is essentially like the top part of the photo, is this upper spotlight thing. And then the foreground is this lower spotlight. And then the difference between them is achieved by moving this uh, dial here. You grab it kind of on those orange uh, lines and you can just drag it left or right to increase or decrease the distance. So in order to really show how this works, by the way, um, you can just grab that slider and that will increase brightness. And I'm going to really high here on purpose so you can see how this other, this little dial works. But I took the foreground and I made it really bright. But if you look at the photo, it's really just the lower, like maybe third, lower quarter of the photo. And so if you want to collapse that distance uh, or you want to expand what's considered the foreground is a better way of saying it. In other words, you want to scoot that kind of gradient line higher in the photo. Start dragging this this way. Actually, I had that backwards, didn't I? Drag it that way and it takes it out. If I drag it this way, it's going to expand that brightness higher into the photo. So it's making it more foreground, more of that brightness going into that foreground. And so for me, I like to do one of them pretty high. And what I want to do is kind of darken the sky a little bit, maybe, uh, maybe about like that. And then I like to come in here and kind of play with this gradient kind of between them. I actually don't want the foreground to be that bright. Uh, I want some of that contrast in that foreground. So I'm going to go a little bit darker and just move this back and forth a little bit until I kind of get a look that I like. And so now if you look at the before and the after, slight darkening, essentially adding a little bit of contrast, if you will, uh, in the photo, which I think is a nice little addition. Now in landscape, you've got three different sliders. You've got golden hour, which is this one. And golden hour doesn't really work a whole lot in this photo. So I'm going to go ahead and take that back to zero. This is foliage enhancer. There's absolutely no foliage here. This is frozen tundra. So uh, we've got none of that, but we do have the ability to come in with some dehaze or some fog. If you slide it this way, you're just cranking that dehaze and that kind of cuts through some of that stuff. And if you slide it the other way, you're getting fog. You will notice the, the number at the top says fog 10, 15, 20. And at some point when I come back down, I hit fog zero right there. And then the next move starts to become dehaze. Uh, well, I, I went a little too fast. Fog, there it is. Dehaze zero, dehaze one, two, three, et cetera. So you can use that either way. You either add fog or you want to dehaze the photo and kind of cut through the haze. But you can see it has a nice little impact on the photo before and after just a little bit of dehaze there and that's all I really wanted to use. Now I'm going to go into details and show you how these work. You've got small and medium and large. Small and medium are here in the same place. So again you can just grab the small and as you grab it you can see it kind of increases in size and uh, kind of uh, zooms in for lack of a better term. Now I don't recommend usually doing a lot with small details simply because you get it to look like that. Let me zoom in and I'm doing this with my fingers, just the typical like swipe motion. But you can kind of see what that's doing when you zoom in. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons I don't really care for using small details because I think it kind of, I, I don't, I just don't like the look, I guess, is, is the best way to say it. So uh, I'm going to go back to zero. Medium detail is fine, I think. So I'm going to add a little bit of medium detail. And you can see you just drag that to the right or you can drag it to the left. Same kind of thing uh, with, with small and medium. Uh, and then large is also the same way. You can kind of go left or right in order to uh, create a little bit more crunch in that photo. And I'm going to double tap with my finger just to go back. And there you go. That's probably a little too much. And so I'm going to come over here and I want to pull that back just a little bit, maybe, maybe about like that. Honestly, I find that using the Apple Pencil, you get a lot more control and it just feels better. It's, it's so, so it's a little bit hard for me sometimes when I'm editing in these videos because I'm using a little trackpad on the mouse attachment thing that I have for my iPad case, and it doesn't have the same sort of tactile feel that the pencil has. So if you have a pencil, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't and you're thinking about getting an iPad, I recommend the pencil. I think it's great. And then at the very bottom here, you have a sharpening slider as well. And so this is something that I like to do to images. I don't recommend going crazy high and over the top, but I do like to go 15 to 20. Uh, something like that. So I think I'll stop at about 20 here. And uh, I don't know how well you'll be able to see this in the video. 
In fact, let me zoom in and I'll, I'll get over here so we can see if we can see uh, some of that pretty well. And I'll turn this back on. So that's off and that's on. So you can see that it is a little bit sharper. Double tap with my finger again to go back to the regular view and close that. Now, of course, uh, Curves is included. And if you're not familiar with Curves, it is the most powerful tool. It's really powerful and really useful. Um, but admittedly, you know, uh, some people are kind of afraid of it. I'll, I'm fair, happy to admit I was afraid of Curves for years uh, before I really got into photo editing. Um, it's a little intimidating. Um, all it is, and this is not going to be a full tutorial on Curves, but it's a great way to impact contrast and color and things like that. So a lot of people will come in and just drop a point right there, and that's kind of in the mid, higher mid-tones, and then some people uh, will also drop a point down here, kind of in the lower mid-tones, and they move it to where it ends up shaping itself a little bit like an S. This is what's called an S curve. It's usually a little bit more pronounced. I'm not doing much because I don't really need to do a lot, but you can see where the term S curve comes from. Now, if you end up with a look like that and it's way over the top, you can just get your mouse on top of these little dots, double click, and they disappear and everything goes back to normal. So that's how you reset the tool. And it's the same for each of these where if you click on in any of these individual colored circles down here, it'll take you to the color curve for that color, uh, if you will. So it just allows you to either increase or decrease the amount of blue or the opposite, which would be yellow, the amount of green or the opposite, which is magenta, and um, the amount of red or the opposite of which is cyan, in a photo, and you can do that in the different tonal areas. So highlights, mid-tones, shadows, and lots of areas in between. It's really powerful, and uh, I think it's an absolutely great tool. And having it here just really allows you to kind of fine-tune your edits, because what I want to do is come down here and try to maybe drag a little bit more of uh, darkness, if you will, into some of those darker areas, and you can kind of see what's happening. I'm just controlling the light just a little bit. If you look at the before and the after, I'm creating a little bit more of a, I was going to say creature from the Black Lagoon, but I'm just making that lagoon, that ice lagoon, a bit darker and make it look a little deeper and a little scarier. All I'm doing is playing with the light because I am on this uh, this part of the tone curve, this one that uh, my mouse is currently hovering over, which is the one for just the tones, whereas the colored ones represent the colors. So uh, anyway, all I did is make a little a difference in the contrast before and after, and honestly, makes a huge impact on the photo. Now, having done that, I want to show you monochrome as well, because this is really cool. And I think I uh, kind of uh, skipped over this one pretty quickly in the uh, last video. So I want to share you uh, a couple ideas here. This is the color version. So if you're a little triangle that you just click and all it does is you click and drag it. But uh, when you're on those three colored circles, that's indicating that you're in the uh, on the colored version but you can see as you uh, scoot over it now says cyan and the cyan uh, little dot circle is highlighted and so that just affects and you may be familiar with this with monochromes where you have these different kind of, kind of color settings there with the red uh, look looks pretty nice here's the yellow and then you've got green and i'm just clicking and dragging each time there's magenta uh, and then of course you've got blue um, I like all of them. I'm not probably going to go with monochrome because I just really like my color and I like the blue. But admittedly, it's probably a little too much blue. Uh, but that's how monochrome works. It's really easy. It's just a slider. And all you do is, you, or, well, let me rephrase that. All I do is I go and I just drag it to each one and I basically audition what it looks like. I'm like, do I like the red? Eh. Do I like the yellow? Hey, cool. Do I like the green? Do I like the blue? I just slide it and check it out. Audition, that's the term I like to use which one looks best and then hire the one that I like best. In this case, I'm gonna stick with color, but I do wanna go back and take the blues down a little bit. So I did a little temperature adjustment here and all you do, just again, grab and slide. So I'm gonna go back to uh, maybe even zero so it's not too blue. And then of course, I've got saturation and vibrance here. And if I hover over this and grab it, you can see uh, vibrance of five, saturation of eight. So maybe I'll take that down just a tiny bit um, in fact, you can also desaturate here and start to make a really desaturated, almost monochrome kind of look with a photo like this, where there's not a lot of color other than blue and white and black. So I can pull that saturation down, still have a little bit of that blue in there. But uh, I double clicked it to reset it to zero. I think I'm going to leave saturation and vibrance the way it is. But um, as you can see, the before and after, and I'm going to do this over here, I'm going to touch my finger to 
the uh, screen and hold it on the iPad screen. That's my before, vastly different, and that's my current state. V vastly over the top? I don't know. Uh, I told you, I've been kind of pushing things a little far. Shiny object syndrome, I'm happy because it's fun and new and all that, but it's probably a little overdone, and by probably, I mean definitely, but uh, despite that, you can see how powerful of an impact you can have on a photo with really just a few minutes. I mean, if I wasn't talking this whole time, then it would be, uh, you know, maybe a five to seven minute edit, and then I'd have a really cool idea of what I want to go do when I take the original RAW files into Luminar Neo on my laptop and do the full editing with the masking and all that kind of stuff. Uh, by the way, now that I've looked at it, I kind of think a monochrome might look pretty cool because, you ever notice this about monochromes? You can have a color photo that's really contrasty and over the top maybe in color and things like that, but then you make it a black and white and, you know, when it's color, you're like, oh, that's terrible. That's over the top. But then you take the same one, and all you do is you turn it to black and white, and you're like, hey, that's pretty cool. That's a dramatic monochrome. Uh, and that's kind of what it is. So maybe I, maybe I will go monochrome. Um, anyway, just some thoughts about that. That is how all these different tools work on the, uh, I'm going to call it the editing tab, just to kind of stick with the phraseology that I use in Luminar Neo. Keep in mind, over here, you can switch to uh, sky replacement. If I wanted to, I could do that. And of course, this little film canister roll thing, you have all these different kind of uh, sort of toning uh, kind of uh, options for, it's almost like a LUT or a preset. So you have those options as well. Um, I can come back and do more videos to cover some of these things, but I wanted to walk through a full edit and show you what you can do with Luminar for the iPad. There it is before, there it is now. Hopefully this gives you an idea of how the different tools work. I literally used every single one of them in this video because you can see that little dot uh, that I'm hovering over here next to the on off switch for each filter. That little dot indicates that this tool has been used. So just FYI, but one more time, my friends, before and after, that's the power and the fun, frankly, of Luminar for iPad. Hope it helps. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys soon. And until next time, adios.